Okay. All right, it is recording. So this is the EU and OPS interview series. Um, today I have Brian. Hello, how you doing, Danny? Doing great. How awesome. are you? I'm doing really well. I had a very eventful day, a good bit draining, so but my energy's back up, so I should be good. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, that's good to hear. Um, so first of all, what are what's your OPS type? Okay, yeah, so uh, MF, so audio, ESTJ, so T-E-S-I is what they shaped me. And I am blast play, consume sleep. So I'm a, a crackhead at the top. <laughs> I'm, a mo I'm, a, uh, I'm a skib in the middle and I'm a mop on the bottom. <laughs> All right, good way to put it. So uh, what, now what is your, uh, your full Enneagram universe typing? Okay, so social self press, and then they type me three seven nine, and the three has a two wing, the seven has a six wing, and the nine has an eight wing. Awesome. Yeah, so that's gonna be really fun to dive into. Try to see what's connected. Uh, usually, I I make like this hypothesis that your uh, your core enneagram type is like directly linked with your OPS lead function, that may not be true. Maybe it is true, we'll see. Um, so we'll see if your TE at the top is, um, like if you use, like if, if when you're describing the three, if you are using lead TE language, then we'll see, maybe that's linked. All right, so it's gonna be really interesting. So first of all, um, how did you get into OPS? Oh boy. Uh, I'll try to make this brief. Uh, I never did have Myers-Briggs and all that stuff when I was a kid. Uh, had no psychometric analysis of any kind growing up. I didn't I didn't even know what any of that stuff was back then. And it's uh, yeah, I moved between my junior and senior in high school. And I never did get what you get in high school from a guidance counseling or a testing and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't know what it was. And uh, I went to college got a mechanical engineering degree that was a uh, pretty rough sled. And then I started working in my professional job once I got out and found the job. And uh, I was in that job is in a space program here in Houston. And frankly speaking, I felt like I was not good enough to be there. Oh. That, uh, you know, working with the smartest people on the, on the planet pretty much. And, a lot of other folks felt that way, but I particularly felt that way for many reasons, which maybe we'll get into. But uh, yeah. so about just a few years into my career, feeling that way, I had kind of made a wager myself that uh, I had this great opportunity. I was going to I was going to go out a winter and I was going to work five years and I was going to bolt out of there. So around your I don't know what it was, three or four years in, I saw Rice University here in Houston had a cooperative extension program. And I opened up this br br brochure and it said, test yourself for a career change. And so I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to go take this test. Hmm. So I went to Rice University. I was in my 20s and they gave a, what's called a 16 PF, a FIRO B, a strong interest inventory, a values assessment and the MBTI. And hmm. so what the way they orchestrated that is huge room of people was one Saturday you came in and took assessments for like six hours then you know with some breaks and then you went away and then two weeks later you came in and gave you results hmm. and so that's when I was assessed by myself you know subjectively through their system with a hundred something questions uh, as an ENTJ so hmm. what I remember from that is a lady named Jackie Hing administered the test and after it was over you know, that's the first time I've ever had anything like that done in my life. I've been, you know, my, well into my 20s. And she says, can I talk to you? And I'm like, sure. And so she said, she said something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing her, it must be a little interesting being you. And so that was kind of my first, you know, interpretive lens for being an NTJ and getting these results and trying to process what the hell does this all mean? And should I switch careers or stay in the space program or whatever? 
So the reason why I'm saying all that is because, you know, I right off the bat, first time I get an assessment and I get an input like that, it made me real introspective and kind of a little bit wondering about how different I am and why would she say something like that? Of course, she meant it well, but the way it was delivered to me, maybe I was just being defensive or uh, you know, self-conscious or something like that, but it, it, uh, it was interesting. So now I'm going to dovetail back to what I forgot. When I was about in the sixth or seventh grade growing up, along the lines of being different, and my sisters and my cousins and a lot of people I grew up in this small town in South Louisiana would say, you're, you're different. You're weird. You think differently. Does your mind ever shut off? And so that's a backdrop to this as well. And the point of the matter there is that, you know, I was like, okay. And I actually conceived probably in about the seventh grade of a concept of what I call a duplicate brain. And I'd go out into the woods out in the country, you live way out in the country. We were the last house on a country road with woods and swamps and all that stuff out. And so I, I was out there by myself all the time. I created this game called Duplicate Land. And essentially that was way before Dave and Shan ever conceived the type twins, but that's essentially what the game was. And I'd go way out in the woods, this tree, and I invented this, I'd go around this tree in a ceremony. And when I came back, I was the other version of me. And the reason why I did that was once I, uh, you, know, you know, The Hobbit was a book that I liked. I was very, had an in adventurous mind being out in the woods and exploring and very creative a as a kid, but super shy and never would share stuff with folks. But I think the reason why is because, you know, I kept hearing you're weird, you're different. And I was like, I believe as this young lad trying to figure out, well, wouldn't it be cool to meet somebody exactly like me one day? and kind of just talk and converse and see how I come across. And uh, so that's the backdrop there too. I'm not quite doing this in the order, but when I got that assessment and she gave me that input, it kind of pulled me back to that original thought and my upbringing about feeling like a duck out of water around my immediate family and being so different. Then over the years in the professional environment and because of curiosity, I took the professional Myers-Briggs a total of four times, uh, three times, all ENTJ. One time it was almost ESTJ. So it yeah. was like, a, you know, close on that dichotomy in terms of the results. And then I got Myers-Briggs credentialed in the middle of COVID. As my wife said, hey, you love this stuff. You ought to go practice it. So yeah. there was uh, an opportunity potentially to, to do some guidance counseling at some junior colleges and community colleges around here. And as a coach by then, that was something on my mind. So I said, I'm going to get credentialed. I did. I self assessed myself once again as an ENTJ. And, you know, that was kind of the backdrop and learned all the ins and outs, spent the whole week, got credentialed, got certified, have my certificate somewhere. It's with all the others. I don't really know where they're at. They're kind of in a pile over there. But uh, I learned about Marsh Briggs, and there was a the teacher of that class was in the middle of getting her PhD in depth psychology. And my peers in it and her, along with the comment my wife had made about how much I like that subject matter, all kind of came together and, and like just really pulled me to a new level of curiosity about what cognitive functions are, what are these dichotomies? What's this crap all about? And how can I learn and grow from it and use it as a, a tool in my coaching? Because by then I was coaching. And self-discovery and self-improvement as well. So then I was talking to a few different folks in the Myers-Briggs world. And I got the comment again about, well, you're kind of hard to figure out. Hmm. So I'm like, okay, cool. And one of those parties told me about uh, objective personality and that it might be something I'd be real keenly interested in. So by the time uh, 2022 rolled around, two years later, thereabouts, I'm like, all right, it's time. It's welled up in me. The curiosity's there. I want to find out what this is all about. So Googled it. Voila. Found out about it. Joined February 6th of 2022. Submitted my video. June 1st, which is 
over the 90 day limit, got my shave on July the 2nd of 2022 and found out, oh shit, how the hell am I introverted sensing? Because uh, that was quite in contrast to my assumption, everything I was told, everything I was assessed, et cetera, et cetera. So on OPS, that's kind of how it happened. And then, of course, I'm a social psychology junkie. I love people. I love learning about people. I love listening to their stories. Uh, I've jokingly told a few people in the tribe here that uh, people in the tribe and listening to them and following their stories is like my version of Netflix. Because uh, I rarely watch TV series or anything of that nature, but I'd rather like meet somebody in a coffee shop or follow their story on, you know, you know, you know, voice chat or OPS posting or videos and those types of things, and kind of like just follow along and and just learn about who they are and what makes them tick. Because uh, I'm just keenly interested in that stuff. So I warned you it might be a long wow. story, but uh, that's my <laughs> best story. That's really good. It's really good. Um, so, wow, that's really interesting. So you had start, for, for how long exactly did you uh, type as ENTJ in total? A few decades. Because uh, wow. I was in my 20s. And by the time I took the Mars Briggs uh, class, I was in my 50s. So, you know, three decades of time and me thinking that I'm an ENTJ. And of course, I guess some of that's, you know, subjective. Some of that's, uh, as Caroline Leaf would say, the reticular activating system. You kind of like reinforce and see what you're looking for uh, and falling into the belief system of, I think like a lot of people, we're all looking for a fit. We're looking for belonging. We're looking for home. We're looking to attach to something that feels like this, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I think I was no different in that regards of uh, just wanting to find that home. And so I made ENTJ my home for all those years and looked at life through that lens. I was told many times in my work world uh, that I'm very strategic, I'm a natural leader, that I'm very uh, intuitive, um, all the things. Your mic cut off. Who did it? Did me? I, I think my I disconnected for half a second. I don't know why that happened. I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> I'll keep rolling. I got I got this brand new mic, man. So I, I didn't want to be disappointed that puppies have <laughs> been out on me already. Oh. Um, yeah, no, it was it was mine. Yeah. Okay, good. So so anyway, what was I saying? Um yeah, yeah, even I have were... these moments. <laughs> that totally scrambled my brain there for a second there. So a little OE moment, I guess, right? Or senior moment yeah. in my case. <laughs> but so anyway, it's like, okay, I was talking about owning it and seeing the lens and people telling me that I was strategic, people telling me that I was uh, very intuitive. And I've always felt that way. I've been told that since I was a kid by my great grandmother. She was very intuitive and that I was a natural leader. Well, mm -hmm. those are the markers that ENTJ descriptors say pretty much. Right. So I had all the reasons to believe that that was what my cognitive functions were. But as it turns out, the way I put it is, Marsh Briggs is a good tool. You know, I, I don't want to speak down about it. I believe all tools have their lens to look inside of you and to gain something of value, some perspective that's meaningful. Of course, if you're looking at it and you're getting the wrong answer, then it could be counterproductive. So we always have to have that caveat. But mm -hmm. the best way I could describe it, there's a few folks in the community that really and I'll mention some names, Rob and uh, uh, Tom, who made some comments that really illuminated things for me to let me start to see and construct how in the hell am I SI versus NI? And how the hell do I not have SE? Because I had a total of, I think it's 32 people who had assessed me before I got my shave. And about three quarters of them said, you know, NISE axis in their mm. guess, either STP or ENTJ, or INTJ, uh, in, in a variety of different things. So apparently myself and others were all seeing something in all the assessments were. And then since then, I had Jack from World Socionics assess me and he assessed me as an 
uh, an ENTJ in socionics, although it's different, I, I understand. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was pretty confident with that. And uh, I took Dario Nardi's assessment and had a conversation or two with him. And he typed me through his system as uh, an INTJ as well. Or I'm sorry, ENTJ. So okay. like, how? what the hell's going on here? So it was a struggle for me to try to wrap my mind around this. And like I said, you know, we're all looking for identity. We're looking for home. We're looking for self-understanding. And I thought I had that. And then all of a sudden, Dave and Shan are saying, I'm something called SI. And I'm like, hey, didn't you listen to my shave video? I talked about a 10 year period of time where academic memorization was horrible. Of course, I had that bit set in my head, like a lot of people that SI equals good memory. And as it turns out, my memory is phenomenal, but just not in academics. And but I meet all the other markers of OISI in Dave and Shan's system. And so the way I could put it is, is that at your very top level, you've got the simplified you know, cognitive functions, you know, uh, young in, uh, John BB, you know, pick, pick your expert. Right. And that is what I now call the summary cognitive functions because they, they can't quite characterize everything sufficiently because there's not enough granularity. Hmm. And, but when you cut it lower and then lower and you get under the hood, and you have 512 moving pieces, now you can start to see inside yourself with greater clarity. And I can definitely see now that Dave and Shan got me correct because it's it's the feminine NE and the masculine SI. They're close to 50-50 in my mind. I think an NE Don would argue with me on that, but I, I'm pretty firm that it's close to 50-50, but the SI wins the day. And those two come together, and, and I don't want to speak on his behalf because this is not his assessment, it's mine, but Nardi has terminology that's, you know, analytical and holistic versus masculine and feminine. And in his system, he's got two different types of NI. And one I call, now, now this is my terminology, I call it sniper NI. And that's basically masculine and very pointed pick a point and that's where you're going his other ni is called oracle ni and i think some kind of way my masculine si my feminine ne and all these years of thinking i have ni kind of some kind of way come together and give me it's 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 any and si but i can quote unquote hack ni at an oracle level which means it's not as pinpoint it's a regional target versus a very pointed, you know, narrow target. Does that make any sense? No, it makes perfect sense. I, I would also add that um, at the end of the day, functions kind of don't really exist like they do, but it's like, it's a little bit more gray. So it's possible that things can like merge and create more unique um, like percentages, I, I would guess. So it's possible. Absolutely. And I'll dovetail off of that. Surprise you not. I got a little little uh, thing to say about that. To me, the the perception functions are, are vastly harder to wrap your arms around, characterize into seeing mm. somebody than the decider functions. I mean, you can see FI and TE and you might mm. not be able to tell the difference between T and FE sometimes and TI and FI sometimes. In fact, mm -hmm. recently I made a comment to somebody who's an INTP that she's a very INFP-like INTP, right? Uh, but I think the preceding functions are the way I kind of, my little simple mind here is, okay, look at it like a systems engineer. So we have, I've studied logic and reasoning substantially over decades. I've studied emotional uh, and sentimentality, interoception, neurobiology, moods, and all that stuff for now for like five or 10 years. And the way I put it is there are a few handfuls of logic and reasoning tools. Mm. There's probably several dozen types of emotions, but there's terabytes 
of information coming into the human condition every day. And as you were saying, it's like this, almost like this melting pot in the perceptual world, in my opinion. And to blend them in different ways that can take on the look of other functions is the way I, I surmise things. Like, for instance, I have masculine SI. I thought I was SE all these years. I could jump a fence, or at least I could when I was younger. Pretty athletic. And I have SE. I mean, NE. So maybe all those some kind of way amalgamate into an SE-like trait that I can use not as my first line of handling the sensory, because that would be introverted sensing, and I'm confident with that, but a pretty decent fluid capacity to SE as well. It's just not my first instinct of my brain. And I kind of mentioned to you how I might can hack NI as well. So I'm getting carried away here. My apologies if I'm getting into too much detail, but I agree with you that, and the reason why is why as I explain it, you know, the, the perception functions, there's just so much more information flooding your subconscious, your unconscious, your conscious data throughout your entire life that you're trying to deal with. Whereas the deciding functions, yeah, you practice them and they're they're part of your brain structure and your neurobiology and it's part of your propensity. That's why you're, you know, shaved, they're classified as you are, but they're kind of like repeating functions. Whereas the perceiving function, there's like just phenomenal amounts of varying information that come in. It makes it harder to wrap your arms around it to me. Mm. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me because like just in general, having to solve problems, we have to be more fluid and uh, uh, like adaptive um, to be able to survive and, and figure things out. So it just makes sense why, um, like it's almost like a requirement for us to be a little bit more diverse on the perceiving side. Um, so that, that just makes sense to me. Yeah. Hey, good. Never know when I, when I'm, when I'm blasting something out, you know, it's, Sometimes no, it's good stuff. It's really yeah, good it's stuff, good. honestly. I, I like, like, I would rather there be a lot of information if it's this kind where it's very interesting, very uh, informative and stuff. That's that's really good. I like that. Um, but so let's see. So, so next, T let's TSI, let's... right? Right. So just to uh, so well, yes, actually, I, I need to ask you how you got into the EU. Uh, oh, okay. EU. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, well, like a lot of social psychology junkies, I heard of Enneagram over the years, saw books at Barnes and Nobles because I'm there at least once a week and saw the books and like, what is this? And I, I scan and read thousands of books and buy hundreds of books, read about mm -hmm. dozens of them, to be honest, but read them all in part, as, as I say, but fully only a few dozen. But I saw the Enneagram. I knew it. I started, like everybody else, seeing these assessments and different things online. I took some of the Mickey Mouse versions, kind of like I did with Myers-Briggs, the 16P, some of the, uh, I feel, very inadequate assessments. You get what you pay for. Uh, mm -hmm. But as I read the books, the three jumped out pretty fast to me as a, something that resonated with me. And so that's a backdrop from, like, say, seven, eight years ago. And then inexplicably... Uh, I was asked by someone in the midst of having a conversation, had I ever considered being a spiritual director? And so I was kind of like blown away with that question because I, I was a coach by then. And this was, so this was uh, April of 2017. So I'm like, uh, no, I, I have not considered being a spiritual director. What the hell is a spiritual director? So I ended up looking into it. There was a program here in Houston, a three-year program. Uh, prayerful person, I discerned through it and it just kept calling my name. So I entered this spiritual direction program. It's, a, it's very similar to coaching actually. Highly complimentary to my coaching programs that I got credentialed in. Well, it's a three-year program, only meeting every Tuesday night. And so I went from 2017 to 2020 and finished in the middle of COVID yet again. And in, uh, I guess it was February-ish of 2018, so year two in the spring, we had three 
nights in a row, three Tuesday nights in a row on the Enneagram. And the folks that taught us the program, there's a whole cadre of them, about eight or nine different, you know, professors, teachers. Uh, two of them were from the University of Notre Dame, retired professors. Uh, one, well, two, well, they were both nuns. And so we did that and we were using that to kind of practice what kind of questions to ask the folks we sit with. Because when you're spiritual director, you're not directing. It's the wrong term. Your companion and your purpose is to sit and ask them questions for them to explore their relationship, you know, their spiritual life with their creator, or whatever it might be. So uh, she's talking about that. And she said it could be very beneficial for you guys to know about the Enneagram. Richard Rohr, he's uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's got something called the Center for Action and Contemplation. So she showed us some videos on him. I'm like, man, this is really interesting stuff, you know, because I've got that feminine Enne in me here. So uh, I like the, the mystical and the out there kind of woo-woo type stuff more than I think uh, a lot of people say. Uh, Dave and Shan will probably say an ESTJ likes uh, tie-dye. I don't like tie-dye tie-dye but i do like out there conversations right so that's how the the any manifests itself for me so we assessed each other and we took this this this, uh this assessment it was copyrighted so she passed around a sheet sheets of nine sheets of paper long narratives and we all sat at our desk there's like 16 of us in the class and each of us read through it and we rank ordered which ones we thought we were. And I looked at it and, you know, had that three background that I told you about. So three, five, seven, uh, they all jumped out pretty fast as possibilities. And, but so did eight. And so we compared notes, we had our, you know, we, we practice on each other, sitting, hearing their spiritual story and looking at it through the Enneagram lens. But it wasn't enough material for me to really get a good feel for uh, what Enneagram was. So I was still very loosely educated on what it was. But I read through the manuals and then I crowdsourced, surprised nobody, um, on Facebook and asked, hey, is anybody in my network familiar with the Enneagram? And if you are, send me your impression, cold turkey, on what you think I am. Well, it was almost 25% of each three, seven, eight, and five. Oh, wow. Like, great. So I narrowed it down on my own to a three and an eight. And then the professor of the class, this almost 80-year-old nun, she's a rock, man. She was, she was amazing, a powerful, powerful person. So I went and I said, hey, sister, what gives, three or eight? And she says, Brian, I'm pretty sure you're an eight. So I'm like, okay, all right. But I went back and I read through all the materials. And in fact, I've got it right here. We use this book, which I know a lot of people in the Enneagram community have. And what she did was she took this book and she created a summary sheet. And I'll show you this. It's a little embarrassing, but it's also insightful of each of the nine types in a one page page sheet of paper. Well, when I read through that and I looked at all the descriptions, the three was just me. Um, mm -hmm. Everything that I saw in there just called back to different things from my life, the challenges, the way my mind works, something called a holy idea, my aspirations, my systemization, orientation, all those different things, and of course, the image and the deceit part, too, which relates to, you know, not really understanding who you are and always trying to put on a, a face. But so anyway, uh, so then after OPS, I keep hearing people saying, hey, have you heard about Enneagram or University? And I'm like, no, not really. Well, you ought to look into it. I heard this from somebody. I don't recall who it was. Several people, actually. And so I said, OK, what the hell? Let me let me look at that at some point. So I did just a few months ago. Finally did it. And uh, they they gave me my type. And here I am. All right. So um, 
That's interesting. So you kind of already knew that you were going to be a three, and that's exactly what they gave you. So that's cool. You, you were always like really close on your type every time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and and I was I knew I was last first. Uh, I did have a little bit of a spurt before my shave, thinking I might be an INTJ because I didn't understand OPS. I'm a I have this term called consume cheat, which means I don't listen to Dave and Shan much. And I I learn by asking other people questions and having conversations. Uh, it's a little inefficient, which that's not TE, right? But it's how I how I how I learn. So I knew I was TE. I knew I was FI at the bottom because way back in the in my 20s when I found out I was an ENTJ the first time, uh, that lady Jackie told me says uh, she made some comment. Which this is like 30 years ago, so I don't re recall it exactly. But the gist of it was is you need to start paying attention to how you feel. Mm. Well, basically, she was telling me I had demon F5, and boy, was she correct. She so, planted a seed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I knew I knew a lot of my shave, and I knew, and actually, with the help of some other people, I cur I exactly guessed my uh, my enneagram or type. Mm. So yeah, I see. Wow. All right. Well, you had a head start then <laughs> by getting it right. Because you easily could have gotten it wrong and then you would have to like completely switch gears. But that, that wasn't the case. So that's really good. Um, so let's see. All right. So let's just jump into the OPS type first. So you are um, MF, TESI, Blast, Play, Consume, Sleep. Um, let's start with Lead TE. Um, how are you seeing like the you know, how TE manifests for you personally. It's also feminine TE, so let's mm -hmm. put that in there. Makes a lot of sense. I didn't know the female, uh, male distinctions before. I just knew the TE. And the first, when I when I got that ENTG assessment, it, and, and I, I got a performance appraisal from a, a pretty high up guy at the same time who had a lot of experience, Apollo Arrow guy, and he called me a natural leader. And so I started like looking into what an ENTJ was. And again, you know, some of that self-fulfilling prophecy, some of its interpretive lens, whatever. And I kept saying leader, 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 leader. In fact, I'm a leadership coach now and have been a leader my entire life, as it turns out, even though I was shy when I was young. And so the TE just to me, I call it Bob the Builder. You know, you're 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 looking at all the resources, the people, whatever it is, you've got a vision at OI. And you're going to construct and build something to get from point A to point B. And so I can't turn that off. You know, from my various, my uh, most earliest things in life, uh, the TE resonates just through and through. So there's, there was zero surprise there. It's just a matter of opening it up and saying, oh, okay, this makes sense. So that's what I've been doing all these years. Project manager, project leader, uh, supervisor, manager, you know, big picture leader, uh, strategic mindset, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, to me, TE is a big tool in the toolkit to be able to do those things. So, and, and as it turns out, that's the way my brain is wired. That's interesting. So how about the, the decider part of it? Do you see how you're, you're a decider? I do. And, you know, I'm probably talking too much already, so I don't want to go into it too much, but I did for a little bit think I was an observer. I've got a lot of, uh, you know, theories and ideas that are kind of, you know, might be put into the observer category. Uh, not necessarily freak outs, but curiosities. Uh, not necessarily conspiracy theories, but strategies and systemizations that really add up. I, I do play in conspiracy theories too, because it's fun as shit. But there's a lot of observery things that I, I, I noticed in myself. And other people have as well, because when I had all these pre-shaved guesses, several people guessed, you know, NI lead as well. But, uh, or o OI as we call it here. But, you know, the desire part, maybe it's an artifact of my age, you know. Uh, you, you, know you're, you know you're getting up there in age and you're not a young spring chicken when your mailbox has a lot of uh, AARP applications in it, right? 
So you're eligible for that 55. So, you know, do the math, you know, before you get to that age, you start getting them for several years and you look at them. So, you know, I've lived a lot of life as my point. And I have, I think TE is the ultimate growth mindset tool in the toolkit. I I really think along with being a double observer, as I now know, but I cannot recall any moment in my life when I wasn't growth mindset, when I wasn't looking forward, trying to construct or build a better version of myself to learn more, to adapt, to, you know, even be humble and learn from people, you know, vastly less experienced than me or whatever. And it, it, to me, it's all TE that's been in play all this time. Mm. So the double decide, the, the, the single decider, there are people in the community, I'm sure, that would say, yeah, you're a single decider and, and the evidence is everywhere. I haven't resonated with that as much because I see so much observer in me. And also because as you age, I think, you know, you say somebody who's mid-20s versus mid-50s, that's three freaking decades different. So if you look at me as the same way you're going to look at somebody who's shaved to somewhere between 18 and 26, 27 years old, you're going to probably need to make assumptions, assessments, uh, say attribute this is because of this a little bit differently. Because uh, I've lived a whole ton of, of experiences and had a lot of opportunities to go through dozens and dozens and dozens of training workshops, administer them, and study psychometrics, emotional intelligence, and all these different things. Now, that doesn't mean I'm really well refined, but it does mean that I've had a lot of opportunities to round myself out and to kind of do what we call. I've been through a lot of the hero's journey and still am going through a lot of the hero's journey. I've done a lot of what we would call integration. I've done a lot of facing the demons and the, the functions that don't come natural that I'm not fluid and good at and still am not. So it's really hard, I think, for me to look at myself because you can't see yourself. And I think it's hard for me sometimes to take inputs from the tribe because I noticed so many different times a lot of assumptions that in lenses and the theory and the stereotypes are just highly resident in the observational comments. And so circling back to what you're saying is, you know, I feel rounded out as, as an observer. I think I can kind of at least hack the other two and do the two that I do really well. Mm. And I thought that I might be an observer because I have this propensity that I look at all these different interesting things, so to speak. But I mean, yeah, decider swings, move infant TE to FI, especially over the last several years, in the last year, in fact, uh, I can see that at play. And so at the end of the day, it's a long way to answer your question to say, yeah, they probably, that's probably correct. But it's harder for me to see, and I think it's harder for other people to definitively say, yes, you're a single decider. The other reason, Danny, is quite frankly, I think, and this is my own assessment, I reserve the right to be wrong, like I say, all the time. But I have something called the FI ecosystem. You know, it's my demon function. Hmm. And to me, there's two major components of FI. One is that it's cognitive. It's your values, it's your morals, it's your worldview, it's your interests, it's your hobbies and your brain, your heart's feeding your brain and your brain's predicating those facets of your FI. Mm. To me, there's the other component where your heart's feeding your body and it's a bodily sensation thing. So your sensations, there's an internal sense of a felt, a feeling inside of you. There's emotionality, there's a mood. And all those things where your body's highly participant in the FI version. Again, I know some people will say, nah, you're wrong, but I'm going to just say it. I think I'm almost like an ENFP in terms of the cognitive FI. But I'm a super mm. demon in terms of the bodily FI. Mm. So I can, I would always come up with the term back when I was an ENTJ, just a couple of years ago. I uh, interviewed with a guy who does an ENTJ podcast. And I made a comment that my FI was cognitive. And, yeah. and I think it still is. However, 
I've been working really hard on trying to, as I say, light up my insides and feel more human. And in some circumstances, I may have done that too much, to be honest with you. So I'm, I'm on a, a very steep learning curve to understand the processing part. So to answer your question, TE, absolutely. FI, cognitive, I almost feel like it's almost a savior. FI body, it's a super demon. Mm -hmm. So the traditional OPS type of recognition of single designer, sure, there's evidence of that, that people who observe me and listen to me now talking or have seen me or interface with me can, can certainly say that. And the swing, yes, I've, I've, I've experienced the swing for sure. Um, but I do feel when it comes to the, the, the mental cognitive part, I've always given great consideration to FI values, morals, ethics, and those things. Doesn't mean I haven't missed the mark in big time sometimes, but my brain has always been preaching that story to me. And in fact, I, 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 I have something called the platinum rule. Which the, the golden rule is not good enough. The reason why the golden rule is not good enough is when I'm doing a golden rule, I'm making assumptions and I'm projecting onto you that I know how you want to be treated. So, because it's the same way I want to be treated, right? Uh, so a quick lesson that I learned, I once gave a, a gal an award in front of a whole conference room of a bunch of important people. And the next morning she came into my office with a purple face, closed the door, said, can I have a seat and have a talk with you? And pretty much lambasted me for giving her that award. This is like 15 years ago. Or longer mm -hmm. and I'm like I'm a little confused here and she said something to the fact that you just embarrassed me in front of all the friends who also worked on this project who didn't get a thousand dollars who didn't get there didn't get called up in front of all these people for one I never want that kind of attention I'm pretty sure she's an INTP or an ISN, mm -hmm. ISTP probably ISTP actually I don't want that attention to you make me feel really bad around all the people because now I hang out with them and I got this and they didn't and I feel like shit. So I learned the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule that day through the school of hard knocks in my early supervision uh, experience, or management experience at that point. And so the golden rule is treating someone else the way you want to be treated. The platinum rule is finding out how they want to be treated and treating them that way. And so I learned then to do a little homework before I gave out awards or made assumptions about, oh, because guess what? That's projection, right? Because if it's me, you give me a award in front of all these people and give me a $1,000, say I did a good job. Hey, I'm an Enneagram 3. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to shake your hand, smile, take the picture, leave the conference room, come home, throw the wife, whatever. Voila, we're good. <laughs> But she didn't like that. So, again, that's why I'm saying is uh, my top value in my FI is the platinum rule. And it kind of right. summarizes so many different things. And, again, I'm not professing to always be hit the mark. The word sin in the Christian construct means missing the mark. I've missed the mark. Right. But my intention is always to do that. And so the single decider part when it comes to treating people or trying to do what's right for folks. The TE, the feminine TE is about being considerate, giving people voice, making sure everybody feels heard, you know, because that's what feminine T does. It's accommodative. And the masculine and FI top value of the platinum rule combined together. And it makes me feel like I'm almost a double decider in my own mind. And again, I know some people would say that's bullshit, but that's their opinion. My opinion is that way. But again, when it comes to emotions and processing them and having the nuance and the sophistication and the capacity to handle a tidal wave or a tsunami, yeah. I'm a flat out single decider and there's going to be decider swing. It makes sense to me. What's also interesting is you have a seven fixed secondary and I, I have the feeling that would probably be connected to your consume. So maybe that's the, the mental FI that you were talking about. wonder if 
that's why it could maybe feel like a savior because it's um, secondary. So it's pretty strong. It's not your last um, fix or anything. Mm. Uh, so I'm curious to explore. Yeah. So, you there. know, if you wanted to talk about mechanizing OPS and Enneagram, yeah, the, the feminine in any and the, and the Enneagram seven definitely married together pretty nicely. Hmm. All right. We'll get there. We'll, we'll hit on the seven later on. But Okay. So, all right. So the masculine SI, uh, you already spoke a lot about it, but can you like summarize um, exactly what it does? Okay, so right before we started talking, I got a text. I, I, I lead a men's group on Tuesday morning. I have three men's group. I lead two of them and participate in the other one. And so I sent him a message. Hey, by the way, we're meeting tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock. I'll send out the email tonight before I go to bed. And these folks all worked with me in the space program dozens, you know, a few decades ago. And they're scattered all over the country. And now I re, re -gang, got the gang back together. And uh, we are comparing notes and the nature of our, our men's forum is, is to support each other in life because, you know, sometimes, you know, you need that. So it's like a support group of old friends who have a lot of time invested. It was a lot of remember wins and storytelling, right? There's some yeah. faith components to it and all those different things and more. And we have an acronym, which I won't bother you with, that, that summarizes all that into one term, which is SI in and of itself. Uh, I'm answering your question by saying that these are the same people that I felt way less smart than when I was working with them. Hmm. However, I found out since then that they felt I was one of the smartest people they knew. The reason why I felt less smart was because the same memorization issues, which I attributed to SI before OPS, that I had in my undergrad, anything that smelt like academics in, at NASA, preparing for a sim, memorizing stuff for a meeting, giving a presentation, I struggled there as well. So I had this backdrop of SI is my enemy. I hate SI. Uh, in fact, call out to Jamie from the tribe she's the one that insisted i was si because she saw it because she has it she was right jamie i apologize again for <laughs> saying you're being mean to me by telling me i'm si. you were right and the reason why is because my freaking memory is phenomenal and now i know it i thought i i thought my memory was my biggest enemy and it is if i have to take rote memorization memorize a lot of information in a short period of time and then take a test on it I had, I had test anxiety because my memory was poor. And it was like a self-feeding thing that got worse and worse because I had performance anxiety for taking tests because I ran into a pattern of doing bad on tests and it just took it on a life of its own. But when it comes to everything else with SI, logistics, remembering things across the timeline, I have conversations, I can remember planning trips, you know, where I was when I made the reservation to go on my trip around the world. Anything that relates to logistics, me living through the experience, and especially if it has something to do with mask and FI, my my SI is gonna it's gonna be all over it. And I'll have my senior moments, but you know, I'll have my human moments, but it's it's really, really strong memory-wise, but more importantly in the SI, my mind is and, and my coach training helps this a lot as well because when i i had a session to set just right before you hour and 40 minutes i probably talked less than five minutes yeah i can do it wow. it drains me right but on si it's like i'm listening to this guy talk i think he's an enneagram seven pretty sure he was extremely frustrated. That matches. It's a frustration wing, right? Or, yep. or fix. Pretty sure he's an ENFP, probably a jumper, probably seven, seven nine, three, my guess, hmm. with a six wing. So I was like listening to him talking and kind of inside shutting up and processing it. So I was kind of multi processing. I was kind of laughing at myself because I'm like, He's me in a lot of capacities. He's kind of preparing me to talk to Daniel. <laughs> um, 
But the other reason why is because the SI for me is I can listen to a pretty lengthy conversation and then my mind just has a tendency to say this, 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 and this, boom. Hmm. In fact, uh, then uh, uh, Laura Miller and I have this SI lab series we do. And we had uh, Jason and Habib on. And they were telling about their their tricks and trades for typing. And so I listened to Jason, uh, listened to Habib talk about his tips and I listened to Jason talk about his tips went on probably about 10 minutes or something like between the two of them, maybe 15 minutes. I'm not sure. And when it was over that SI was working all in the background and I didn't know it. I wasn't trying. It don't have to try. And then all of a sudden I'm like, okay. Habib said, be Zen. Jason said, be humble. Habib said, iterate. They both said, have a process. So in the moment, I took their summary and bloop, it became hippo. Humble, mm -hmm. iterative, process orientation. And then later on, I added the second P to make hippo with two Ps, and it's practice. And those that's my way of summarizing that 10, 15-minute segment. And it was effortless. It just mm -hmm. flowed out of me with, and, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And to me, that's SI, the capacity to organize information that's coming in and to distill it down into tiny little nuggets that summarizes a 10 or 15 minute segment. And as a coach, I was trained or it was emphasized to me that you, you do a few different things. You give people space, you shut up, which believe it or not, I can do really well when, it, when I'm getting paid to do it. Otherwise, forget about it. Um, <laughs> You, you, you know, you empathize, you, you, you validate, you listen, you observe, right? You do all those different things. And then you kind of like, you do some checkpoints where you say, after listening to them talk 10, 15 minutes, you might say, hey, may I offer you a feedback on what I heard just to make sure that I'm catching you? To me, that's SI. And I can do that really, really well for my clients. And they're sometimes startled that, wow, that's, wow, can I write that down, you know, and they'll write it down. So it's, it's, it's this mental propensity to gather in information. And it's personal to me because it's my job, because my FI is involved. And also because I like people and I'm interested. And it's this capacity to take information and just summarize it and boil it down and then give a list, give a summary, uh, give a procedure. And at NASA, we had to do that all the time. NASA is the consummate SITE uh, situation or uh, TESI. Uh, mm -hmm. Both of both of their they're there in spades. So again, I lived a long life. I had you know a quarter of a century working in that environment where it was like that was the way things were. Uh, the mantra was, "In God we trust; all other bring data." And uh, if you're going to summarize something, you better that program manager, that astronaut or that flight director is going to kick your ass out of the room if you come in there and babble forever. So if you're going to babble forever, kind of like I'm doing right now, it better be content rich. It better be germane to the topic, because if you're OE scattered all over the place and that you lose them, they literally, especially back in the days, they literally might say, get out of here. Wow. And embarrass you <laughs> in front of all your peers. Yeah, I've seen it happen. Blessed, um, I was blessed to never have that happen to me because I saw it early on. And I'm like, that's not happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> Am I answering your question? What about the SI? Yes, you are. That, but that's very interesting. I never had thought that SI would make an acronym in order to summarize what they've gathered. I never thought that they would. I actually thought NI was more likely to do that. Well, okay, so Laura Miller and uh, Linda from the community and others have pointed out to me that it's not SI, it's NE. So it's the SI-NE axis. So the SI okay. is taking in and categorizing, and then the E, NE scanning the options and the possibilities and the creativity, and then they're combining together to produce that kind of uh, output in terms of an acronym, right? Now, in terms well, of I a always... 
Yeah, go ahead. I, I always I always thought that intuition categorizes into like um, a generalization, like a broad category. I always thought that is what does it instead of SI. Well, I I could be wrong. Uh, that's just my understanding. So that's why we do these things. Uh, yeah, I, I could be wrong too. I don't know. I it could. I I would have to go go around and process that. Try to yeah. figure out if like because I yeah I, I never thought SI would do that. I thought it would be more like a list of the sensory. Well, it's 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 intrinsically, internally, subjectively taking in the data and organizing it, OIing it. So the list, the summary, the procedures, there's a whole bunch of, you know, we're holistic beings. So it's like, it's an amalgamation of all these different functions working combined together. But the SI to me is the fundamental propensity to collate, to, co you know, to consolidate, to summarize, to streamline, and then to deliver. And the NE comes in in that process, it's kind of like they're swirling together, I imagine. And the any is like looking for a kind of a creative opportunity or possibility ways to kind of creatively put it into an acronym or something that's succinct and easy to remember. That, that's yeah. my understanding of how it works. I see. I have to think about that. I, I see some like, because my, my, I have SENI, so I think maybe I'm kind of trying to make it my functions, but it's obviously not. So I'd, I'll have to process that more. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. That's what we're doing, All right? right. Uh, we, yeah. we talk it out, we learn. And like I said, I always reserve the right to be wrong. My thing is that, like, because, and I actually have this problem when I do typing. Um, sometimes somebody's using any, and because they are, um, like speaking a theory, I, I I think that they're blasting because for me, NI is what speaks the theory. And so it's the blast is the theory. And so mm. like w when you're using your play to speak about a theory, I'm like, is he blasting? Like, is that like, is he summarizing? Because the theory can be like a summary. So. So that's, that's your NT blast, right? So you're looking at it through that lens. Yeah. Yeah, that, I'm like, that oh, makes he's sense. doing that, but he's not. He's actually doing play. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, play yeah, versus so. blast. Uh, those some some uh, interesting distinctions there. Speaking of, let's hop now to your play, your T E N E play. Um, how do you uh, how do you see yourself using it? Like, do you see yourself like throwing um, theories, or how how do you use it? It's they're it's double activated, double feminine NT play. So it's like wide net. It's a considering and looking for every freaking possibility that it can possibly happen, mm. and then accommodating TE different ways of pulling that together towards some solution, you know, some kind of pathway mm -hmm. forward. So, uh. It it kind of manifests itself in different different ways in my in my in my personal life and in, in my hobby life, right? Mm. Uh, I love to to talk to people out and about, and so my play. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, earlier today, I had to run by the mall. I went to shop. Went to Zara. I like Zara. It's one of my favorite places to go. So when I go to the mall, which is not often, I'll usually pop by Zara. I'm standing in line. Uh, the men's section didn't have a, a cashier, so I had to go to the, the, the lady section. And it's a long line. So uh, I'm play chatting. There's a gal in front of me. She looked like an athlete. I said, hey, volleyball, soccer, tennis, what, what's your deal? She's about 5'9". Uh, mm -hmm. So she, she kind of laughs, and she says, I'm, I'm soccer. I said, ah, I bet you're good, huh? And she's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, I like that. So we just kind of went back and forth talking about different stuff, you know. So to me, that's mm -hmm. that's kind of play, uh, chat. Uh, me asking her questions, her responding. Turns out she plays for the Houston Dash, which is uh, the soccer team here in Houston. And uh, 
So mm-hmm. it was a real fun little chat, but I, mean, I found out a good bit about her. You know, she played abroad. She, she, uh, you know, where she from, all that kind of stuff. And told her a little bit about how I never played soccer, but I was really good at kickball. My claim, my, my, my humorous claim is I was the world's best kickball player that never had a professional kickball association. So to me, that was kind of like just a fun exchange and a, a chat, you know, it didn't know where the conversation was going. It was just an exchange of ping ponging of asking each other questions it lasted five minutes. Hmm. So that's kind of like a social play type of conversational series for me. It comes extremely fluid and easy. Uh, you know, with very I few exceptions, so. I, I could I could have a conversation with pretty much anybody when I'm out and about. But when it comes, like if I look back in the work context and a problem solving like engineering, uh, you know, we did like missing simulations a lot. And basically, so there's lots of, uh, like if we had a mission anomaly, which I participated in what they call tiger teams. Tiger teams, when some when we're on orbit, it's a no shit moment and we got a big problem. We got to solve it. So there was something called an action center and there was something we put together things called tiger teams. And you'd right. go into the this conference room and basically you just, you know, it was kind of like I was perfect for it because it's it's feminine TE and feminine NE. You know, what are all the possible things that we can do to solve this problem? And what are all the resources and the possibilities and different ways to construct this solution to turn it into then a procedure that we can give to the astronauts, go sim, send it up, and they can execute it for the mission. So when it comes to play in that context, it's like sitting in a conference room or on mission control or whatever, and just talking and and ping-ponging back all kinds of different possible solution candidates and and eventually coming up with a, a few solutions that you then present and one of them would get accepted and, and implemented. And we did this quite often, you know, the, like in the space program, what's really interesting about NASA is for everything you heard that was an accident or an almost accident, there was a whole bunch of things you never heard about that we did that with, right? And the reason why you never heard about them is because we had these teams and we would address it and we'd throw a whole bunch of, and there were a lot of, a lot of any users involved in those types of uh, discussions, yeah. conversations. So in a, in a professional sense, that's my example for how I would do play. And it was like ping ponging back candidate possibilities, ideas, solutions, uh, ways of doing it. Once we came up with a context or an idea. And then in the personal life, to me, it's like, just being curious and asking people questions and just them asking you questions and just keep going back and forth. Hmm. That's interesting because um, it, it sounds like it still kind of does fill in details. When you ask NT questions, you are getting like sensory information at the same time. Um, so for me, it's like, I'm like trying to understand the NESI part here. Like, um, when you're asking those questions, you're like taking in both intuition and sensor, you think? I don't, I, oh, absolutely. Um, hmm. I, I, it's my claim. I, I think I'm a very balanced double observer. And I think at some level, I can hack the other two observer functions. So I'm, I'm observery. In fact, when I went to my coach training classes, there's a model called the OAR model. And this uh, this guy Julio Holala, he's a uh, he was my my coach. He's from Chile, and he goes, "Oh, is the big observer in the sky." And so, the the training that we got and the emphasis from him is that if you're going to be a good coach, you're going to get help your client. The number one thing that you can do for them is to become a master observer and listener, et cetera. And the number one thing you can do for them is to nurture and work with them in partnership for them to become the best observer possible, right? Mm. So, you know, in terms of the the SI and the ENI, like you're saying, and when I was having these conversations, 
it was century. There were some ideas that are thrown around. Like if I go to a coffee shop and I have a conversation with an NFP probably because they hang out there and we are both Delta. So we like have great conversations. It might be about all kinds of possibilities. It might, it's abstract ideas and it's that, that fun, you know, ideation. And that's like the experience itself is almost is, the talking about is almost as good as actually doing it. Right. So that's when it's more the NE, but sometimes it's, it's inevitably, you know, whether it's masking SI or whether it's hacking SE, I don't know, but, you know, talking about soccer, uh, you know, that's, that's a concrete thing. That's a century thing, but it's play. Hmm. Okay. Well then I think I'm understanding like the shadow SE is definitely a thing because at least for me, I kind of relate to like shadow FE where somebody is talking about stuff they like, and I do get a sense, you know, this is the stuff they like mm -hmm. and if it clicks or not with mine. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably is just a thing. Like we have everything in our brain. Our brain has, you know, everything the same basically. So it's not like it's not possible to gather sensory. Um, well, everybody so does everything right. It's just, again, yeah. it, and again, I don't want to sound wrong here, but if I'm comparing myself to 30 years younger than me, I better be able to be more well-rounded and be able to hack all these different functions so that everybody does everything thing takes on a completely different complexion. And if you're looking at somebody who's, you know, 22 years old and they're getting shaved and they barely live life, mm -hmm. well, and you're looking through the stereotypes and you're looking for these markers and all these different NI summarizations, that's fair to a certain extent. And it's probably fair for experts like Dave, Shannon, Michael, and others who are really good at typing to do that for myself as well. But it's just, to me, life rounds you out. It's like FI, you know, it's it's knocking on my door and it's constantly trying to come up for air, as I call it. You, you've kept me in the vacuum all these years, buddy. It's my time. You know, life has a tendency to forcing you to round yourself out. So you can have all this growth mindset, you can have intentionality, you can have awareness, you can have a project plan, you can have a, a coach, a consultant, a spiritual director, or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And that's all great, but life's gonna end up doing that for you anyway. It's just mm -hmm. how do you pull them in and make them work harmoniously with one another? Mm. Interesting, okay. All right, so let's jump to consume the, your any and fi. Um, this is technically both of your demons, um, but it is your third animal, so it's probably easier to access than the sleep. Um, how do you relate on the consume? Like, how, like when when exactly do you see yourself entering consume and using consume? Well, they call it your hobby animal, right? Yes, and uh, I call it my soul animal. Because it might be third, and it might be technically a demon, and it is. It's almost like the FI. There's It's bifurcated. Like FI, there's a part that I do really well and a part that I do horrible. I kind of yeah. feel the same way with consume. Uh, I can consume a whole lot, but it's very stratified along all. I have lots of masculine FI interests. I, I, a few people I've conversed with, I mean, almost stream of thought could list like 30 different things uh, on the fly. Boom. There it is. So my consume is pretty expansive because it's feminine NE plus masculine FI. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of FI interest. So the bandwidth of that son of a gun is really big and it could go all over the place and you're screening it. That's what consume is, right? You're scanning and then screening down what you're interested in, what you feel resonant with, and then you're you're consuming those things. Well, it turns out I got a lot of things I like to consume. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, the demon part of my consume is is like listening to Dave and Shan videos, for instance. You know, I, I I don't I don't do it. It just doesn't resonate for me. Uh, I don't really get much out of it. It kind of aggravates me. It's not their fault. It's my fault. But it doesn't work, so I don't consume. So I that's why I consume cheap. So 
like these books behind me and my shave video I pointed out. She's like, read them all a little bit, but I haven't read any of them fully. In fact, I've got this book over here, which I just bought. And it's one of the few books in my entire life that I've read. And I just bought this brand new version of it. I told you about it. Well, I got The Hobbit, right? Mm -hmm. So like this is the book when I was a kid is the first book I ever read front to back. And honestly speaking, there's been very few since. So that's the consumed demon in me. It's just, if I'm not keenly interested in it, fortunately, I got a lot of interest. But if I'm not keenly interested in it, I'm checked out. If I, if I, like these books, like I mentioned, I go to Barnes and Noble every week. For every book I have, I probably scan read 20 of them. Mm. So one in 20 made the cut. And so these books are actually books that I've dove into and actually consumed fairly well. Not fully, but fairly well. But wow. when I'm doing this scanning at Barnes and Nobles or Amazon or whatever, and I pick up a book and I look at it, it might have an interesting title. I'm like, no, put that mm. back on the bookshelf. I'll never read it. That's really interesting to me because, um, yeah, I mean, they do say that when you have demon consume, it will be harder to finish books and stuff like that. But I, I, um, my, my ex-wife, she was typed as consume last and she actually read a lot. Like she was always reading all the time. Um, but then with myself, I'm lead consume and I never read. Um, sometimes I'll buy a book. And when I used to be married to her, she would read the book for me <laughs> and tell me what was inside of it. And I just, I just, you let I, her go, I, man. I'm <laughs> demon reading. <laughs> I'm, that's I'm that's a dream right there, man. If, that's if it's that's consume cheat, Danny. That's <laughs> the definition of consume cheat. You I mean, it could it. be my my savior sleep. Maybe I'm just you know demon play. Like I don't want to st read or I don't know, but um, yeah, I think it it can just be case by case a little bit too. I'm not sure. Yeah. But, yeah. So it's a mixed bag. So my consume. And my FI are both, a, it's it's bifurcated. It's either great or it's horrible. And they have to co-live with each other in this system. So it's hard yeah. to answer that question other than the way I just did. I see. Okay. And how about, um, because part of uh, NF Consume is also like exploring possible identities that you can take on. Um, how do you relate to that part of it? Well, I kind of see that, you know, FI's demon in the third and fourth slot for me. So Enneagram will talk to that too as a three uh, and the challenge is there. But yeah, the whole concept of having an identity is, is especially in the last 10 years, is something that's kind of soul shaking to me. It's, yeah. uh, I consider myself very thoughtful, deep thinker and all that stuff. But when it comes to my own essence, uh, until the last few years, and even now, it's a puzzle. I, my mind doesn't know how to process that. It's like, what are you talking about? And now studying Enneagram, and especially listening to their podcasts, the Enneagrammers folks, uh, Courtney in particular, who did some podcasts, I think it's episode 095, she talked about the attachment uh, dynamics, relational attachments, or yeah. relational objects, whatever. That, that gave me huge insights into my identity. In terms of the OPS system, all I know is got a good idea what FI is. It's in my consume demon and my sleep demon. And I'm trying to get more meditative, more introspective, and to crack that open and reassemble it a bunch of times, kind of like a, a moat does by nature, so that I can get more textural understanding of what this concept of essence beingness versus doing and identity is so you're right you know scanning the waterfront with the feminine and e and the fi's down there and there's different components of it in my mind there's the fi emotionality sentimentality part there's the identity part too as you're pointing out so i guess i hadn't thought of it that way it's a real good additional lens for me to look at it's like i'm scanning it you're right that's part of what my consume is i'm subconsciously consuming trying to identify who i am under the hood i just haven't really explicitly thought of it that way before 
for me, I've been explicitly thinking about it from my sleep, my that double mask and SI, FI sleep. And that's really where I've tried to address my entity, my identity component. I see. Okay, interesting. Um, so the, it is um, a different way of experiencing it between consume and sleep. I see. Well, yeah, and, and you're, I'm, I'm real grateful for this conversation because now I have another lens to go off and think about it that I hadn't considered before. Or maybe I should have. It might be a no-brainer to some people, but to me, uh, I guess I hadn't consumed cheated that realization. It is it is very interesting because like definitely with consume there's like different facets of consume itself there's different facets of sleep you know each of them has different layers um, with consume I mean it can be literally taking in new information that may pertain to one of your interests or it can be like especially like NEFI consume it'll be like um, like imagining what would it be like if you felt like this versus like this versus like mm. this in this situation or that situation. Um, so it's like puzzling the feelings through. And... <laughs> yeah. So, okay. That's real good because I have done a little of that because I do that. With some, I can help my clients out with this, but helping myself, it's kind of like the, mm. the heart surgeon who has a heart attack or the mechanic whose car sucks. I can help other people do this really well. And I think you're pointing out to me why and how, mm. but mm. I have not had the proper full lenses to do it on myself. But what you're saying is I have done a little future projection, you know, cause it's SI, it's not just the past. It's, you know, it's, it's OI, right? Mm. And back when I used to think, I thought I was having NIFI. So I thought my sleep was gonna be NF, you know, NIFI. Mm. And so before I got shaved, I thought a little bit about it there, too, as I started learning what, what uh, sleep was. And I did what you did because I attributed wrongly, in part, I think partly right, NI as being about the future. And so what I was doing was I was kind of doing what you were saying there. I was like using NIFI as a lens to saying how well I feel when I get here, how well I feel when I get here. But now that I know differently, it's maybe I'm using NIFI as my instrument to do that. And then complementing that with this backstory of me trying to open my life experiences and textures and emotionalities and memories and my feelings and amalgamate all that into some kind of better understanding of who the hell I am. You know, I call, I call myself B. It's kind of a joke to myself because it's a summary of a bunch of nicknames. So it's easy, yeah. but the inside joke to myself is, who the hell are you, B? And who are you as a being, right? Yeah. Um, and so this is why I've attacked sleep processing uh, more significantly than anything else since I got my shave. It's because I have this strong longing to have a better chance to comprehend who the hell I am and have mechanisms and tools and contemplations and meditations or sitting silent with myself and letting it come to me and all the all the things that people tell me are part of sleep processing. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm doing is I'm, I'm mope processing, right? That's what you're pointing out to me. <laughs> A new term for Laura for the glossary. Mope processing, <laughs> uh, which is what the mopes do. And that's why they're so good at knowing who they are and who they're not and owning it. And that's until the last five or 10 years of intentionally trying it. I never even came up for air to think about that, which shocks me because I'm a very thoughtful person. I think about everything, but it, except for me. Mm. Very interesting. We, we are going to jump now into sleep, which is going to be interesting because it is your last animal it's your double masculine animal as well so it's like very significant in, in your whole stack um so how like for you what is sf sleep strange analogy have you heard of the supercontinent pangea yes okay so this one all the continents you got a globe behind me i'm a globe guy they're all magically together and then they broke apart because of tectonic plates and all that good stuff. 
to me, that's kind of a model of thinking about sleep processing for me. Mm. So it's like, imagine it's a 3D version of Pangea and you can open it up and there's a whole bunch of different ways to kind of clean it off, inspect it, look at it, introspect, understand it, appreciate it, feel it, sit with it, let it wash over you. All these SIFI anecdotes from your life. And then over time, do that and put it back together, do that and put it back together, which is my model for how I think a moat kind of lives. And I don't yeah. want to speak for them, but that's my perception. It's like they're constantly doing that. They're constantly like pretty much figuring out who <laughs> they are, what they are and what they're not, what's we, what's they, um, all those facets and owning it and lining up in their IP-ness, right, usually, or the way I look at it. And having thousands of reps of opening themselves up and putting themselves back together a little bit better each time. And so like it's a curve of it's like exponential growth and they get super good. I imagine in their teens into the 20s, they're like the knee on the curve to use an engineering analogy. And they're just zooming and having just rock solid understanding of who they are and who they're not what they feel, what's authentic to them and what isn't authentic, you know, uh, T-I or F-I, whatever the case may be. And me, I was just out there dancing, doing stuff and never thinking about that kind of stuff. Mm. And so the Pangea model, to me, I've got my own earth, it's the, the B earth, and it's got different parts and I can pull it open and I can look at it and I can expect it and I can see how I've arrived at a self narrative, how I've arrived at the things that are me and not me, my hobbies, or is that me? You know, my LSU football fan, does that make me a tiger? Yeah, well, maybe in part, I love hiking and, and traveling the world and I've done it. Does that make me a hiker? Yeah, in part, you know, you know, whatever. So it's like the Pangea model to me, that's how I'm approaching this. I'm inspecting all these stored memories collated into a bunch of SI nuggets that have a lot of FI instances attached to them. Because that's the way our brains work, the hippocampus. If something's emotional, like your first kiss. Okay, I, I told her I said this on the internet before. So Rosie, my first... But my you know, girlfriend, 14 years old, on the side of Sonia Tallinn's pool party. She had braces on. I kissed her, cut my lip. I got teased about it. Okay. <laughs> How can I remember that? Because it's an SI stored organizational nugget because mask and FI was running on steroids in the moment. This is why the firsts and all those kinds of things throughout our life are so memorable. Well, when you've lived 50 plus years, guess what? You have a whole lot of SIFI moments. And unfortunately, in my case, a lot of them have never been dealt with. Or I've mm -hmm. dealt with them in shallow waters versus deep diving. And so if I pull this Pangeo, this episode, this episode, this episode, this piece, clean this off, this no longer suits me, throw that out. Now let me reconstruct it back together. And each time you do that, you get a tighter and tighter sense, I think, of who you are, what you're all about at your depth. And to me, that's what sleep processing is all about. But right. I, again, I reserve the right to be wrong. And if somebody's got a better idea, I'm all ears. It makes a lot of sense to me. I actually really like that analogy, like the the continent is like just shifting and restructuring. Um, so it sounds like w whenever it's expanding, it's doing the NEFI. And then when it's like, like if the structure is becoming more um, solid, then that would be the SI part where it's like, okay, well, this is the um, the last best, most solid, definable version of the understanding of self. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, um, it's like software, right? You, you, you compile it, you get a new version, you have to you know, but debug it, get it beta tested, all this kind of stuff, recompile it and then release it. Right. And you go through a whole bunch of versions, like a lot of the software used at NASA, you know, it's like we're on version 40 
because it had been around yeah. so long. You know, each time they did that, they were doing like you're saying, inspecting it and putting it back together. So to me, it's a different version of who you are with greater granularity, greater clarity, greater understoodness, that's a word, and more ownership and more comfort. And so you open it up, put it back together, open it up, put it back together. Each time you do that, you're kind of knocking the rust off. You're kind of mm. like maybe making the pieces fit more coherently together than they maybe they were kind of like <clears throat> shoved yeah. together before and it kind of fit. And then you have to use some duct tape to, to, to put your globe together. But over time, maybe you smooth that out or file it down or get out the lathe and clean it up, take a part out. And then each time you do that, I think you get a tighter and a cleaner and a more coherent sense of who you are at your at your base level. And I'm like a baby. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm in my 50s. But in that sense, it's unfortunate. But I never thought that way before. Doing what I'm describing right now is the most alien concept imaginable for me most of my life. But now, you know, I've read books like Falling Upward by Richard Rohr about the two halves of life. So I've read Erickson's Stages of Life. I've read a bunch of different cultures. And I'm using all those models and then plus with the, the hero's journey and, you know, uh, all the different things we're encouraged to do. And to me, that's what, that's the best way my FNE conceptualization of doing mopey sleep processing is, is uh, mm. to that model. Wow. Very interesting. Um, that's interesting. Cause like uh, for, for my brain, like I'm bleeding with consumed sleep. So I'm like, I've always just been like, or like reorganizing my sense of self constantly. Um, so when I hear that other people like discover that much later, I'm like, like, I'm like trying to conceptualize like how, like, what would it be like to be Savior's blast and play um, instead? So, yeah, that's really interesting for me to hear that. Um, yeah, because you're blast last, right? So it'd be like blast last. Yeah, like, like <laughs> it'd be like me. To me, it's like, how can I not blast? Hmm. In fact, one of my big challenges is is to shut my trap because we don't know hmm. it. I've talked about that in my little blast project. With you, I'm supposed to be talking, so I'm, I'm giving myself a license here. But I've been practicing shutting my trap a lot because the instinct is so intrinsic and strong. You hmm. have to like really almost develop a gatekeeping system and have high intentionality and then practice catching yourself and then get better and better and better over time. Well, I imagine that's how it would be for you to not sleep process, right? It, it, how can you not do it? It's what you've done. It's this flywheel of familiarity that's done thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And then if you're going to try to arrest that flywheel and just sit there and look at it, it's like, uh, yeah. How can you not do it that way, right? So that's that's Honestly, our thing. I, I feel demons. like I feel like sometimes I don't even notice, like when I could be doing play versus when I'm, you know, like I, I don't even notice when is the opportunity to do play sometimes, and that that's usually the trick, like the the hard part about it. Like I have to figure out where can I insert play, um, but like I wonder, like for sleep, for you, like how do you um okay so like uh i'm sure you probably had like a sleep crash before right uh explain sleep crash so a sleep crash basically you do blast play consume for months at a time and then suddenly you're like oh. on the couch for two weeks sleep processing and stuff you know what's really what I really wish, I wish I somehow magically would have known this terminology and have this part of my life being mature and capable enough to, uh, man, I'm almost getting emotional here. Uh, to be able to do this earlier. Uh, when I left the space program, they, they paid me a really 
large sum of money to stay to the end because we were losing people. And I decided I was taking a 16 month midlife sabbatical. I was going to retire, not work at all. If I'd have known going into that 16 months where I did not work for pay, not even one day, wow, the work I could have done. Since then, I've kind of like learned what it is and on the fly, I've been trying to, it's hit me again, trying to do it. Or actually, let me catch myself. The Enneagram or podcast that I listened to last night comes to mind. No, not try to do it, to be it. Because I think sleep processing is more about not doing. And 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 as double masking as I if I sleep last, not doing is a hard, hard, hard freaking task. And just being and sitting in silence and letting emotions wash over you. You you know, because you're not a dummy, that it's extremely essential and valuable, especially as a spirit director. And I can help other people do it. But my flywheels of doing this is so freaking wired up. Uh, turning those flywheels down and ramping up the sleep and moat processing flywheels. Tough. Tough because multiple reasons, but the reason I think it's hit me right now is because I guess it's sadness and mourning of missed opportunities from earlier in life, knowing that stuff. You know, uh, Kendrick, it's this water stuff coming out of my eyes. Uh, Kendrick talked about not with NF. Not leaning your ladder against the wrong wall. So, uh, I'm not going to talk to anything specific, but overall, just conceptually and mathematically looking back, it's like, wow, what if I could have sleep processed back then? You know, which which jobs might have changed? Which things might have been done that weren't done that might be super meaningful? Right. So I'm sorry, I forgot what your question was, but I'm hoping I'm in the hunt. Uh, it's it's the being versus doing. It's that kind of got me triggered here. Because my certification to be a coach in August 2015, I began was to be an ontological coach. I chose that because instinctively ontology is the study of beingness. So if I were to study you as a human being, that would be ontology. Ontological is the process of somebody's beingness and working with them to get that kind of like the Pangea model a little bit better over time. So being able to know that, and that's why I'm so grateful and, and tried to contribute to people that are younger in the tribe as much as I could. And many of them asked me to coach them. I told them all, no, I'm not coaching anybody in the tribe, not by intention, maybe by circumstance i've made mistakes and done that but it was never intended that way but i love people and as a blaster you want to help and i love the fact that people that are in their 20s who are just getting started in life have an opportunity to do it i had no conception of it was completely foreign to me uh the mope and sleep processing and I did have an extremely strong forward orientation to a fault and always have but that was about what would I do and I did a little bit I guess hit on the how would I feel if I do this because I you know I, I did give that consideration but it was mostly I guess the Enneagram 3 and the TESI in me um, where will I be? Not who will I be? Mm -hmm. If I do this, then that leads to this, that leads to this, that leads to this, that leads to this. I've done that my entire life since I was three years old. I could remember kind of doing that in my own little way, my first memories in life. 
in everywhere in the middle. So when you do, 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 you, the concept of inspecting and sleep processing and who you are as a being and what your identity is, it's literally like saying go to Mars and try to find some oxygen to breathe. It's, it's, it's that. So like you are saying with, you can't imagine not doing that. And maybe as blast last, you might have a hard time conceptualizing and imagine how you could blast all the time. Right. So, so I've tried so how, to imagine it. I'm just like, why would I be doing this for this long? That's what it comes to end. <laughs> fair, fair. But again, it's how we're built, right? We're all neurobiologically stitched together with different networks of processing systems inside of ourselves and, and experiences. So we're different. And I think we need to give each other grace. I mean, I'm not going to, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Because in this, this OPS and Enneagram and all this stuff is so fantastic because it gives me a, a greater capacity to give people grace and not to project my capacities onto somebody. Like if I see somebody bird chirping, my blast kicks in and I just want to help them. They might not want my help, but my intentions are good. Because I know that if you blast, especially here in the Western society, that's a good tool to have in your toolkit, right? And if you don't have it, then that might be present some lost opportunities. Kind of like my lost opportunities to know who I was earlier in life and maybe to own it more, and maybe to pivot differently. I lost those. Well, somebody doesn't have blast or something I have, play maybe. Maybe they're missing out on opportunities too. So getting to see folks young and I just love people and I love seeing people grow. And like I said, they're they're Netflix stories to me in a good way. I don't mean to minimize it at all, but you know my point. It's awesome to see people have these tools in their toolkit. You know, I got my problem with David Chan, but I'm just so grateful for what they're bringing to myself and others because the sooner you learn these tools and the sooner you have awareness, you can move what I call the ABC plan. Awareness is huge. Alone, it's almost useless. You get the awareness, though, it's prerequisite to moving to the next stage, B, which is a blueprint. Hmm. So you have the awareness and the blueprint. And then the C is commit and create. And so like for myself, people I coach, people I help in coffee shops, I give away free services all the time because I just love helping people. The first step is, is finding the big A, the awareness. And OPS and Enneagram are, are just phenomenal tools for folks when they're young or old like me to have in their toolkit so that they can then live understand themselves better understand other people better have better relationships have better opportunities maybe ride the more meaningful purposeful enjoyable pathway for themselves and all that and more there's a blast wow that was that was really interesting um uh, there's a lot of nuggets in this whole interview i'm just gonna say that <laughs> really good stuff um so all right, let's hop into the Enneagram portion here. So um, you are social self -pres, um, You're So you're social dominant. That means that you're more attuned to um, the social dynamics in the room, maybe like thinking about like how how is the room going to change based on who's inside of it, um, what somebody says, stuff like that. So just trying to harmonize in that sense. Um, with the self press secondary, it's supporting the social, and so you can – you may want to like um, like provide stability to the social atmosphere. Um, just keep people feeling safe in a physical way um, by providing things. Maybe just there's so there's a lot of different contexts you can apply to. It may not necessarily be sensory. It may be something else. But um, so, do you relate to the social self press? I do, you know, before I got my Enneagram assessment, there was some debate. Some people that seem pretty astute at this stuff said self press social. Other people said social self press. Uh, a little community of folks in, in a few messaging groups that know me well, they were pretty insistent it was social self prev first because they, they, they saw me and how I am. And, and then 
uh, not to put the guys in the Enneagram or podcast down because they're all great, but the 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 gals have given me my greatest nuggets. So Colleen, I think it's episode 035, I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, listen to her talk. And wow, I found some really good insights from her about the social self press. And then also looked into a few resources. And it's kind of like she said, my life word is contribute. I want to I want to make sure I'm contributing, put a footprint. And, and I'm compelled to do that. And service and contribution are, are two of the words that she used in one of the podcasts to describe the SOSP nature, because she is that as well, this person, Colleen. And so... Uh, this these folks in these groups that I talked about, they, they oh yeah, you're, you're social first. There's no doubt about it. Other people saw the collages, which I you know I'm not a huge fan of, uh, and they saw maybe more self press because they saw maybe a caring, nurturing, protecting role in some of the imagery. I personally think it's probably close to fifty fifty, but mm. social probably wins the day because I just want to serve and contribute to people. It's just my nature. And that's my first compulsion, but really close in, in dealing with that is caring and protecting people too. Uh, you can't really decouple those in my mind. Um, oh. But learn, loving people and, and being interested in them and, and trying to socially engage them seems like it wins the toss over uh, the, S, the SP. So SOSP is what I am. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That makes sense to me. Um, interesting. So um, do you relate to like either enforcing or following social rules? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go back to the masculine FI, the top value, the platinum rule. Uh, and the NASA was all rules. Oh, my God. Safety first, safe on time, error free, you know, I, I, I started before those mantras became and watched them turn into all these posters and placards and sayings and expressions and rules. If you can follow rules, you're going to you're going to be a flunky really fast in the space program uh, because it, it's just by necessity. You know, you like I say, you got a two billion dollar space shuttle. You got a launch pad that's worth, you know, a ton. You got seven lives on it typically. Uh you better get used to the fact that you're dealing usually with a lot of uh, former military pilots and people with PhDs who are the package. They're the, they're the customers, right? So following rules for the sake of safe, on time, and error free and oh. for the sake of distilling things down to make it manageable because otherwise you'd never get anything done. So I do relate from my uh, – and I map really well to that environment. Uh, I've always been a rules follower um, or try to. Uh, you know, I have my adventurous parts in me, no doubt. Mm. That's the seven. But for the most part, yeah, I'm a rules follower. I'm a compliant person. Uh, is is that what you're getting at? Is that what you're asking? Well, the, the compliant part may actually speak to the um, your two wing and your six wing because those two are compliant. But okay. um yeah, yeah. For the most part, it it feels like you're following the the self press protocols for the for like a social reason, I guess. Yeah. Well, the this, you know, some people thought I was an FE, uh, hmm. because I think the fem, you know, double activated in my two saviors, feminine TE plus this masculine hmm. FI platinum rule, cognitively. I'm always looking to do what FE people do to kind of make sure everybody's taken care of and to make sure there's, you know, try to get rid of the disharmony, but it's usually cognitive. It's not out of the body. Mm -hmm. That's the big yeah. distinction. So I guess in the same way I do that folds into my SOSP-ness. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 I want to like look out for, because I like people, I want to look out for them, want to care for them and protect them whatever is required in the moment is just my nature 
Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, personally, I kind of relate to that. It's also so press. It can kind of feel like FE in some ways. So, hmm. yeah, that that's really interesting. Um, so, all right. So you are a core three wing two. Um, so three is a um, competency type. Uh, that means it's like neutral. It, like it'll gather information, but it's like purely neutral. It's not positive or negative. It's just what hmm. it is. And then um, it's also assertive and it's, it's attachment. So assertive is like they, it's, it's go getting, like it's gonna, um, it, it, it gives off the image of like, like achievements, stuff like that. Like the image of like, I went and I got this thing. Uh, I achieved this thing. Um, and then the, the attachment, so which the, the attachment basically means that it's like attaching to a, um, like a, a pre-existing um, standard in a way. So like maybe, you know, there's a highly valued image or standard or achievement and the three would attach to that thing and go after that thing. Um, so are you relating to the core three? Yeah, I am for many reasons. Uh, when I looked at this, I made reference to earlier that the nun gave me. Uh, there's just so much about it that resonates, but I'm going to go back to the the Intergrammar podcast, and I'm going to I'm going to cite Nancy and Courtney, in mm. uh, I think it's episode 95, which is object relations, I believe. Mm. And wow, that hit home so much, and I learned and actually did a, an infographic and posted in their in their page uh, just a few days ago because it was so good. And what I really learned in that moment is why I don't never had this understanding of the depths, this comprehension of what identity and self and all this stuff was, was because of the threeness. And the threeness is the way they described it is, is that like, for instance, they said a six, they are going to kind of try to navigate in the earliest years based upon like almost a support panel. And like this group of people and who's providing support to them. So being provided support is kind of like a sixes attachment mechanism. Mm -hmm. With the three, they said your earliest caregivers, a small subset. And I know who those are in my case, because I lived in a very tight, I had tons of parenting. I knew my, I knew everybody it was, had access to me in that age bracket. It's a visibility thing. So yeah. I guess there's something about the way I'm farmed that set me up to be concerned about how I was seen. And I think that's how threes get formed. And so how are you are seen by your earliest caretakers is how they characterize that. And then that yeah. becomes like your, your modus operandi. It's like, oh, that's what they want. And there's something in your neurochemistry and your brain and the way you're stitched together by nature, something that you are looking to see how people are responding to you, if they're paying attention to you or not, and how they're seeing you and cueing off of that to try to discover, okay, how do I get cared for here? Um, hmm. And that is why you get off to the races without an understanding of what your identity is because you absorb at the earliest of stages, the identity that other people kind of are seeing you through, or, or that's how you're perceiving it as a young person. And so I came up with four things is like, I perceived for a variety of reasons. I think there's four uh, to be good, uh, to be productive, to to uh to be compliant i guess there was four things i don't remember what they are now i'm, I'm having a, a bad moment but those four things are how i perceived my caregivers wanted me to be mm. so i interpreted they saw me that way and that that's what they were looking for and so that became my threeness so I'm like, okay, that is my identity. It's what other people have, what I assumed or absorbed other people expected of me. And they probably were because my mom and my grandma and my babysitter 
and my oldest sisters and my aunt and my great grandma all lived within a block of me in a little tiny, small, small house with six people inside of it. So I know in my, ba my babysitter, Eleanor and Rachel, I, I know all my immediate caretakers from my earliest years. And that's why three resonates for me. And I, it makes so much sense to me that that just stuck. And then what did I do? Well, achieve and perform along those dimensions of my assumed capacity to be accepted. And that's my identity. And it just took off and went on for a life of itself. And you never look back because you don't have any idea that's what you're doing until somebody like Nancy and, and Courtney convey to you that that's how you were formed. And that's when you became a three and that's when you became an achiever and a performer and you became so image conscious, even you didn't know it, but your image, you were concerned about how other people perceived you. So then you became visibly image conscious about that. And all those things stitched together over years and years and years. And next thing you know, you have a natural innate propensity to put certain achievement-oriented labels on yourself. Like I fought yeah. for the longest time the joke that I was a rocket scientist. I, I did. But there's a part of me that that was a convenient term. I'm a coach. Yeah. It's another convenient term. It's an image thing. You know, it, I'm a college graduate. That's another convenient term. It's another achieve and it's a perform thing. And unfortunately, there's some goods to that. But the downsides is, is that it's at the cost of never unstripping all that imagery. And you're deceiving yourself, not because you're stupid, but because it's all you know is how to map to what you perceive other people expect of you, because that's how you were built. And that's the environment you're in. And it just keeps going. And so you're deceitful, not because you're lying. It's because you don't know how to be you. And so you're constantly caught up in a, okay, I wonder how other people see me. There's the C word again. And how they would expect me to be, just like your earlier caregivers. And so it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And you become a three. Now the two part, I haven't really studied a whole lot about it, but I did buy this hmm. book today that I'm going to read a lot more about it, too. And what I do know is that I did properly assess myself as a three-wing two on my own, and then they validated that. And the reason why is because I don't really like the term chameleon because it kind of connotes that you're not being authentic. I might not know <clears throat> the depth, the way a mope, an, F an INFP mope that's 26 years old, that's moping it for 26 years knows them, their identity, right? And, and, and knows that authenticity. But I know all these facets of me and what I can do for whatever reason is I can, I can in coaching and we were trained, meet people where they are. And no matter who it is, I've crafted through my world travels, talking to thousands of people, six continents, 50 states, 300 universities. I've had thousands of conversations. I've crafted the capacity to kind of see and perceive other people and then kind of map and meet them where they're at. And a three wing two apparently does that really well. And it also because of that is one of the reasons why it's called the life coach. Now I'm, I'm a leadership coach, executive coach, career coach, and an ontological coach, which is a fancy word for life coach. So in essence, part of what I do is life coaching. And there's this one guy who lives in Colorado. He's an ENTP. We have a lot of heated arguments from time to time, but he, his wife is a superstar coach. And whenever I was, asking people what I was. He said, man, you're three wing two. Like if I ever saw one, he said, you're, the, you got the perfect makeup to be a coach. Keep doing what you're doing. So apparently the three wing two is not only something that I found comfortable with from an analytical perspective. And it says it in the book, but other people have heartily endorsed that because I can kind of 
without being fake, I can kind of, I can contort to being who somebody's going to feel comfortable around for the most part. And there's some exceptions, of course. Some people won't like you. Nobody's perfect. But generally speaking, the three wing two makes sense to me for those reasons. Interesting. All right. So next we have your, you have seven secondary. And we did kind of see it was similar to uh, NF Consume. Uh, and so I'm curious, how are you seeing the, the seven? Well, uh, three and seven are both assertive, right? Yes, yes. So I, I see that. And somebody say, oh, you're double assertive. Um, surprises nobody. I said, okay, whatever. But I, assertive, not aggressive. So I'll, I'll take the assertive because that just means you're going to step out and you're going to take action. Um, and you're not going to shy away from it. You're going to be decisive and you're going to take action towards something. Mm -hmm. But the seven, when I heard about it, it's like, yeah. Uh, I kind of feel like I've got a lot of ENFP in me. I've got all this feminine NE in my brain. I got a lot of skibby in my own way when I'm in my non-interviewing mode. Um, but the word of frustration is the word that came to me the most. And I looked at that word and I'm like, what the heck does that mean? And then it just completely made sense to me. Mm. But what doesn't resonate with me with the seven and I don't want to say this wrong, but I'm just going to say it. I don't like, you know, a lot of people see me as positive and optimistic. Okay, I'll take that. However, you give me something that doesn't add up and I'll, I'll shit on it like that. I'm not going to be positive and optimistic about something that doesn't add up. So I don't like that everything's rosy unicorn, eat some cotton candy, look for a rainbow type of connotation of a seven. And not that that's proper characterization of it, but it's a, it's a stereotype. And so when some people say, oh yeah, you're very positive, very optimistic. It kind of shocked me at first when I first started hearing that years ago. Because as an engineer, I'm extremely critical because as an engineer, you have to be. You have to see what's wrong so you can prevent somebody from getting hurt and you can provide a product that's meeting specs. So you have to be super critical. So I view myself as very critical and any good engineer is going to be very critical. So I had that. So when people would always tell me you're so positive, so optimistic, the way I've constructed that is that that's feminine TE and finding a way. TESI is going to find a way forward. That's positive. And so the seventh for me, I think leverages off of that and creates mm. this can do assertive leadership. We can solve this problem. How can I help you mindset, which is positive, mm -hmm. but it's not Pollyanna because I really don't like Pollyanna incoherent. You know, if somebody tells me, Hey, I believe in you. You can dunk the basketball. I'm like, no, I can't. I dunked it twice realistically about 30 years ago and it ain't happening again. Don't, don't tell me something that's not practical. However, give me a chance to support you with logic and reasoning and something that's coherent and I'll, I'll, I'll be your biggest advocate. I'll be positive and optimistic and we will ride that together. So that's how the seven landed with me. Now back to the frustration. There's two sides of the coin there of the positive thing with the seven, or at least that's, I'm expressing how it landed on me. I wasn't surprised because I heard of these inputs and I'm the feminine in E and the ENFP like crepes in these like seven. So that didn't surprise me at all. Brainstorming ideas, possibilities, positivism, that kind of stuff. The frustration though, that really landed. Mm. But it's not that I'm, what I get frustrated with And, and again, this is projection. This maybe is a little judgment. Maybe this is wrong of me. I'm just being candid. I get frustrated with somebody who is negative. Mm. I, I get really frustrated and I have to take deep breaths and I have to coach myself and I have to say, okay, work with this person. There's been some clients that I've had and I just had to like, we had to part ways because they weren't coachable. 
because they kept snapping to I can't do that or that's not going to happen in these language nuggets. And that frustrated me. So the frustration resonates with me from that dimension is that frustration with somebody who, and it's not their fault, I'm not saying it is, who can't T-E-S-I and see a constructive way forward the way I can. It's hard for me to deal with somebody who naturally can't do that and has a mindset and attitude that's locked into they can't do that. That's when I get really frustrated. So I get frustrated with somebody not being positive mindset. And so that's for right or wrong, how I process the seven thing. It's like, yeah, I'll be your biggest ambassador. If if you tell me something and it, it adds up, I'm going to be positive and optimistic and all that seven stuff and anything's possible. We can make this work. But if you, an unable or unwilling to work with me to help you, I'm going to get frustrated like a son of a bitch. And okay. so that is my interpretation of the seven frustration part. It's not this everything's possible Pollyannish thing. It's more of the, a position from a frustration point of somebody who's in the opposite mindset of that. So whether I'm interpreting this right or not, that's how seven lands with me. Now, the six, I don't really know. I don't really resonate with the descriptions I've seen of six because some of the things I've seen, and I know I'm butchering it, but this anxiety disposition that it talks about and this kind of like, like, like I said, what goes like a committee of supporters. Some are for me, some are against me. We, they, it seems there's a mindset of we, they, Taking sides. You're in my camp or you're not in my camp. And anybody that is, makes a reasonable attempt, I'm in the camp. Uh, I might get frustrated. Because I, I don't get angry, but I get frustrated. But, and anxiety to me is something that, yeah, for sure. I had test anxiety. I gave you an example. Um, if I wait till the last minute and my, my OE-ness has done me a, a bunch of stuff and I got to organize something, I'll get anxious for that too, right? That's natural. Mm. But like generalized anxiety and things of that nature, I've worked with folks that have that and we've made some good progress. Uh, but I don't identify with that other than the performance anxiety from test taking and memorization and this mm. very, you know, so I don't know what the six wing means. I did hear again, these ladies in the podcast talk about that a seven wing six combined with a social self press kind of mutes, tones down the typical seven connotation uh, interpretation. Now she was talking as a seven because this gal, Colleen, is a seven wing six. So it's my second fix. I don't know how that plays for me. But the six is something I struggle with. I don't really know what to do with it. So if you have any suggestions or anybody else does, I'm all ears. Uh, I will say that um, a lot of what you said about <clears throat> uh, being frustrated when people are too negative when you're trying to help them, that does also sound like the assertive aspect of seven where you want to go and go straight for the thing. And now with mm. there's like, that there's no withdrawing involved in that process. And I, I don't think you have too much. I think only your nine fix is withdrawn in your entire typing. Um, so you have like a very little withdrawn energy. So I guess when people are like negative, maybe it's somebody that's like a whiny tears. Uh, it's like six, nine, four, triple, well, not triple withdrawn, double withdrawn, but um, negative on the six, negative on the four, and just, and then with the nine there, they kind of dissociate. So they're just stuck in um, like a, a negativity loop. Maybe somebody like that would frustrate you a lot. Um, so I think, I think the, the assertive with positive together and also the, um, the three being a reality type and wanting to ground things in reality, that's probably mm -hmm. what's linking to that. 
um, the seven wing six, I will say um, six is also a reality type. So um, seven is a fantasy type. So seven will tend to like think of possibilities and tr things that you can explore, op like uh, assertive opportunities is a way to say it. Mm -hmm. But then with the with the six wing, it's grounding it in well, what are structures that are already exist that we can attach to, so that our ideas are not too um, imaginary. Um, so okay. I think I think that may be a way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, some, something for me that you know, I'm still early in my processing of the integrator types. It's only been a few weeks, so uh, I, I don't pretend to to be an expert. Nowhere's close, but uh, yeah, that's something to go explore and yeah. to see, you know, how can I, because, you know, that's why you do this, right? You want to understand yourself, where you're going right, where you're going wrong, how you can construct it better and, and move forward a little bit better each day, right? That's that TE growth mindset, mm -hmm. always looking for it. Um, so thanks for that. No, of course. I, I always try to explain it. I'm not the best at explaining things, but I I try my best. Right, right. Uh, no, no, that's good. That was good. Yeah, I'll some, get to re-listen kind of to this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's hit on the nine wing eight. Uh, nine is also a fantasy type, but this is a body type. Um, so it's dissociating and withdrawing on a physical um, level, like on a body level. Um, and it's also your last fix. So I, I think the combination of it being last and also withdrawn, maybe that's why, like, why you have SF sleep last. I think maybe they might be connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I definitely, definitely have thought that a little bit. And yeah, the way you put it, it's a little better stated than the way I thought it through. Okay. What I've told some folks, confessingly so, is that <laughs> I have this strange analogy metaphor whatever it is it's like imagine a translucent mannequin hmm. and imagine that you have christmas tree lights a bunch of strands of them inside of this mannequin and that represents how much your body has sensation inside of it it's called hmm. interoception hmm. i felt for a large part of my life that my body just it was there I could sense when I was sick and stuff like that, but emotional wise, there was very few of the strands that were lit or capable of being lit. And so I like I made suggestion recently for folks to uh to consider the materials the body keeps the score. I think we all have just loads and loads of different storage narratives events in our body some people can feel them because they have a lot of christmas tree lights inside of them and for good or bad might get activated triggered or whatever really easily i believe gut types possess that they're interceptively live by nature so their gut and their body hold and feel stuff and process stuff. And they are very, you know, they, they honor their gut. If they like somebody or don't like somebody, they know it by being around them because how their body cues them, right? I think it being last for me, combined with what you said, is I'm on the other end of the spectrum. So I'm lively. And right now, of course, you know, people are saying, hey, he was crying a while ago and he's fi and he's got a lot of emotionality look at him boy he's alive like my body's much more lit by intention it's a stanford neurobiology professor that i took several classes from and i've developed it and i've intentionally tried to do that because I, I quote quote i want to be more human as i've told several people hmm. i think the nine the the gut and the body part it's it's muted for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I might have again, kind of like I said with the FI, where it's high cerebral. I feel like I got really good FI, ENFP level FI, cognitively, but super dungeon level <laughs> ESTJ, ENTJ, uh, 
on the bodily emotion. The same thing I think is at play with the nine fix. Um, however, it's it's changing and it's growing, and I'm I'm it, I'm almost having too much success, mm. and I, I'm watching it because as a systems engineer, I I know how things can go unstable, and how you you can't run with and built in a day. And I think there's some care that needs to be had on how I embrace that nineness of me and that sought for, I guess, harmony is the word, right? Uh, trying to appease the people in my midst. But it's, again, it's going to be cognitive. It's not going to be me picking up as much in my body that there's this unease around me like an FE user, I think, does. It's going to be more cerebrally uh, prioritized with a little bit of bodily engagement. Now the eight, my theory on that is like the nun I said at the beginning of this that was pretty insistent that was eight. She said, you have your feet underneath you. She said, your presence and your strength in my in front of me right now is, is alarming. That's what she said. So I'm like, shit, what the hell do I do with that? And okay. she said, so that's why I think you're an eight. I don't know because that's the body gut as well, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the wing of my third fix, so it's muted, but it's there. And so the way I would describe it is, it's like, say we have the bell curve of thousands of users, right? Mm -hmm. And say I'm feminine TE. So the preponderance of my TE by habit and by nature is going to be on the feminine side. And that's very clear, the center of gravity, so to speak. But inside that big tail is my own little tail, my own bell curve inside the bell curve. And it crosses over the midpoint and there's a TE component that's masculine. Don't go there often. It's not a good place to be because it's uncomfortable. But I think that's the eight wing that mm -hmm. goes along with that. It's my masculine TE. And I've told this story to a few people before. I had to come into some meetings with a whole bunch of disciplines with hundreds, thousands, a couple thousand of people to give direction on the launch date or the way we were managing a certain thing back in my day when I was a leader in the shuttle program. And I would go in and normally I was like the feminine TE, you know, hey, everybody, why do you think about this? Very outward, considerate, everybody's voice gets heard and all that stuff. But every once in a while, the situation called for an eight or a masculine TE to come in. And I would come in and say, hey, look, I'm going to piss some people off today. I don't mean to. I don't want to. I have no choice. I can't tell you why. And if somebody would give me some feedback, it'd be masculine TE on steroids. Mm -hmm. Shubby, insistent, strong. And I think my eight wing of my nine the body in those moments, I don't get angry and I'm not violent, you know, I'm aggressive, but I'm super assertive in those moments because I'm like, hey, look, quit whining. I've given every thought possible. I've looked out on everybody's behalf as much as possible. I don't like this any more than you. A third of you are going to leave here and go bitch to your group and your section heads and everybody's going to hate me. That's what you get paid the big bucks for. That's what I got to do today. And I'd snap to the eight slash masculine TE mode in those cases. And if I got any feedback, it's like, screw you. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's making sense. And if I'm mixing the Enneagram and OPS right. But in those moments, I felt my body. This actually leads into our, our last segment here of your overlay is two, six, eight. So 268 is, it's a double rejection type. Uh, two is rejection, eight is rejection. Um, and then with the six, it's um, very pushed. Like it's, it's, it's also double reactive because you have six is reactive, eight is reactive. So um, I'm thinking maybe when you get in that mode, it could be your overlay. Um, mm -hmm. they, they call it the superhero rebel. Uh, so it's basically like um, like the the archetype energy is like it's like a superhero that 
is doing like a bad thing, but it's a good guy doing a bad thing, if that makes sense. So do you relate to that? What I just explained, I think the way you phrased it matches what I said. You know, I had to do the right thing. The program office, NASA headquarters, flight director, whomever, say, hey, look, you need to hold these launch dates. Every freaking body in my audience knew that, that was bullshit. But I had to do it anyway. Why? Politics. We were dealing with the Russians at the time. We had to hold the launch date for international agreements. I couldn't tell anybody that. I'm saying it now, but this is years later. And so I had to be the bad guy, but it was all with good intent because I was basically just saluting my uppers. And people just talked bad about me in the hallway. That one side is store selling bullshit. I didn't get a chance to even defend myself, which sucks. That's a frustration for you when that kind of crap happens. I knew I was doing the right thing. I couldn't defend myself. And so, yeah, I was the, the good guy delivering bad news but the good guy was for the overall program and the big picture. And I couldn't defend myself and tell people that such and such got a call from headquarters and said, hold SDS, whatever's launch date here. And the reason why is because we have an agreement with such and such international partner and they have a contract. And if we don't hold it for another week, even though we know we're eventually going to slide it, some bad shit's going to happen. And, and I'm genericizing this as much as possible because, you know, this is not like top secret or anything, but and it's 15 years ago. But those are the kind of situations that, so it might be the, the, the 268 is what you're saying? I absolutely think so. It's also double compliant with the two and the six. So it's like you're just delivering orders, like you're just following orders and then, but with an eight inside of it. So it's yeah. forceful. Yeah. I definitely think it's the overlay. Okay. Um, well, that makes good so, sense. Yeah, that definitely look into that. It's called the superhero rebel um, tri type. So. Yeah, well, it's a lot. It makes a logical sense. Superhero rebel. I resonate with that in those moments. I only had to do that uh, probably a, over the time. I had that one job for nine years, that specific leadership role. I had to do it about 10 times. Mm. And in the and a lot of the people that were in my panel, I chaired every week. It was a Tuesday morning. Honestly speaking, one of them in particular would say, "Uh oh," when I walk into the conference room, because they probably saw this <laughs> masculine te eight two six eight thing or whatever uh, mm -hmm. showing up. They could see my body language change, and they knew that I was uncomfortable because I was about to deliver. Some very unfavorable news. I mean, like astronauts hated me because they they, they were, we're not launching. What the hell's your problem? Change the schedule. Uh, flight directors thought I was stupid because what what happened to Bertrand? Why why is he acting like a dumbass? And I couldn't tell them. So it was that your your phraseology is really good. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that's that's really good. I like it when we're able to fully connect. Um, the entire thing um so all right so that that that's pretty much our full analysis on both of your typings do you have anything else to to say to the audience i, I think i've worn you out enough <laughs> honestly this has been really good uh thank you so much there has been a lot of nuggets in here um and a lot of insights i'm definitely going to watch this back probably 10 times <laughs> so, god bless you thanks. But don't torture Thank yourself. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's it's a uh, it's like one thing I'll I'll just say is you know it, the one the part of the blasters challenge is is that it, it learn by talking. You know, and so I'm, I'm learning a whole lot on the fly as I'm describing things to you that I didn't realize before, and especially getting some good nuggets back from you. So greatly appreciate it. All right. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.